of gladness, no thought for their sin, no glory but sadness, no room in the end, no room, no room for Jesus, oh give him welcome free, lest you should hear at heaven's gate, there is no room for thee, no sweet consecration, no seeking his part, no humiliation, no place in the heart, no thought of the Savior, no sorrow for sin, no prayer for his favor, no room in the end, no room, no room for Jesus, so give him welcome free, lest you should hear at heaven's gate, there is no room for thee, no one to receive him, no welcome while here, no bomb to relieve him, no staff but a spear, no seeking his treasure, no weeping for sin. No doing his pleasure, no room in the end. No room, no room for Jesus, oh give him welcome free. Lest you should hear at heaven's gate, there is no room for thee. Amen, Father. Uh, be with us now as we seek to go to your word, Lord, for encouragement, Lord, for reflection on <clears throat> what this season means, what we've made it to mean, thinking about Christ and his coming. Not only the first, Lord, but the second. We look forward to that day. We're hastening it in our hearts, hoping and expecting, God, to see Christ soon. Give us of your spirit, Lord. Minister to us today. Encourage us in the direction you want us to go, Lord, and teach us things that we ought to know for the day and time that we live in. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turning your Bibles to Psalm chapter 80. Psalm chapter 80. And as I mentioned... When we're thinking about Christ's coming, often we always reflect on when he arrived here in Bethlehem's manger. But I think sometimes we forget that he's going to be coming again. We ought to be hastening that day and thinking about that day. Here in Psalm chapter 80, I'll begin by reading the whole chapter, but we can see that essentially we now as spiritual Israel now resemble the Israel that's being sung about and, and thought about here in the heart of the psalmist here, Asaph. And so think about yourself being in this picture, in this time, though so long ago, scripturally, it applies directly to us today, I believe. Psalm chapter 80, it begins, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. 
Thou preparest room before it, and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs unto the sea, and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven, and behold and visit this vine, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou made it strong for thyself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, thou upon the Son of Man, whom thou made it strong for thyself. So will not we go back from thee. Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Again, um, a reminder here, and what I'm calling this message is return, O God of hosts. We think about Christ often in Bethlehem's manger coming the first time to a people that, by and large, did not want him. They'd rejected him. They'd refused him. They turned from the prophecies that went beforehand, and he arrived even as we were singing. No room in the inn. No waiting for the Savior. No expectancy. I think we need to stir that up. Though we don't believe that Christ is necessarily coming just this moment, and we believe there may be some things that come to pass before that, we ought still be expecting Christ each and every moment to return. Maybe not in the clouds with the sound of a trumpet, but perhaps He's returning to one of us in particular when we breathe our last breath unexpectedly. It could happen. We ought to be looking forward to, excited about Christ returning. Now us as spiritual Israel, I believe now we resemble Israel according to the flesh. And time and time again, we prove to have that same heart that they had. One of rebellion, one of, one of uh, re rejection of the Lord, one of just, just, I could care less about things of God spiritually. And I find this certainly creeping up in my life quite often. Busy with other things, other focuses, other desires. Here if you read in verse 1, the psalmist comes out and he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. And the reality is, is that God is always hearing us. We don't have to wonder if he's listening, especially to those that are saved. God is there. God is always present. God is always listening in, watching. And here the psalmist purposely says to the Lord, Give ear. Give ear. You always hearing, always knowing, always seeing God. Here I believe what he's expressing is an earnest desire a return to wanting to be heard of God and wanting to see the return of the Lord. Wanting to be heard by Him and wanting to be led of Him. And this is what we need to cultivate. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Turn us again, O God. He continues. The prayer here is that God would first shine forth, that he would stir up his strength, that he would come and that he would save us. Those first three points that are made there in those first two verses, shine forth. He wants... The psalmist wants God to expose us. When his light shines in darkness, it reveals things in ourselves. It reveals our surroundings. It reveals who we are. So when God shines his light upon our lives, it ought to be to the end that we would be exposed. That's just God showing his face. Stir up your strength, he pleads to the shepherd of Israel. Give ear. Stir up your strength. In other words, reveal yourself not only to me, but to all that see. The strength, the mighty arm of God. We want to see that in our day. And he says, come. In other words, Lord, be present. Lord, reveal yourself. Lord, be present. Shine forth, stir up your strength, and come unto us. 
He's crying out to God again to come and return unto his people. To the end that what? We'd be redeemed. He says, save us. Save us. This prayer here is for revival of God's people. And I believe that this prayer begins the work of revival. And what is he asking for essentially? He's asking for God to begin to work. Give ear, O God, listen up. Listen to me, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, thou that has led Israel, thou that has led all of these um, different peoples of Israel, Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. You've gone before them before. Now stir up thy same strength. Come and save us. Look how it begins though. Verse 3, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. He asks here of God to turn us. In other words, God, get our attention. Turn us. You know what happens usually when we ask for God to get our attention, to wake us up, to give us a shake, to stir us up, and we say, God, help me to turn to you. Turn us again. Not just the psalmist here, but he wants the whole people to be turned unto the Lord. Sometimes that comes by way of famine, by way of pestilence, peril or sword, despondency. In other words, you're just utterly hopeless, no hope in the world. Sadness and loss are things that cause us to be turned again unto God. And honestly, some of these things, if the end result were that we would turn to God, then famine's a good thing. If the end result is that we would turn to our Savior again, turn us again, O God, I think we could put up with some pestilence. If the nation as a whole would turn to God, peril and sword ought come upon us because the end would be better than the beginning of the matter. Sadness and loss, if it turns somebody to God, is a wonderful thing and a blessing. It's not wrong to pray then that we would be turned to God and He would get our attention. He asks here also, shine. He says, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine. Cause thy face to shine. In other words, God, show yourself. Show yourself mighty to save, glorious in battle. Show yourself as that loving Father, as that outstretched arm and that merciful God. Shine in contrast to the dark world that is around us. Let us see you. Let us see your face. Peter in his epistle, talking about the Word of God, says it's a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. I love that because he's saying, look, we got the word of God here now. We've got the paper and pen, tangible word of God here. And this truly is a light that shineth in dark places. But eventually that day dawn will arise. Eventually the day star will arise in your hearts. We shall see the living word of God in person. Turn us again, God, shine upon us. That's what we need today. We have the word of God to shine upon us. One day we ought to be expecting his glorious face will shine upon us and we shall see Christ. What a day that will be. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine. This is the chorus of this psalm. And we shall be saved. As only Christ can, we shall be saved. Both from our trials and tribulations and struggles now, of course also eternally, we shall be saved when he arrives. The conclusion, of course, of our salvation, though it's secure secure now, we have the down payment of that, His Spirit living in us, is ultimately that we will be redeemed, put off this ungodly flesh, and stand glorified before Him. But for now, the prayer is that there would be deliverance today. There would be deliverance now in the moment that we're living. Cause thy face to shine, Lord, and we shall be saved. Verse 4 continues with a question. It says, O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? In short, I believe the answer is simple. When we turn to him, when we come to Christ, how long will his face be angry against us and be shunning almost the countenance or shunning almost the prayer of the people once we turn to him? We continue to spin our wheels in this life, grind our gears. We continue to walk in circles, trip, stumble, and fall. We call it to God often at this time as we struggle and as we're going through trials. But are we really turning to Him or are we just looking to Him at our moment of weakness? 
I think that's what God wants from us. He'll be angry against the prayer of his people as long as his people continue to have something else that they will turn to. How often do we have a last resort prayer to God? Okay, now that I've tried such and such and such, and okay, now I will pray to God. I've spun my wheels. I've ground my gears. I'm walking in circles. I'm struggling. I've reached the end. Okay, now it's time to pray to God. No, we get to, we got to turn to him first. Verse 5, it says, Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. These people that have not God there ready to hear them because of their choices are mourning, they're weeping, they're languishing. Verse 6 it says, Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. We continue to be at strife and contention, mocked and ridiculed and scorned among our neighbors. The question again is asked in verse 4, How long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? The reality is, is that God didn't go anywhere. He didn't leave us of his own volition or will. Ultimately, what happens is we leave, we turn away from him. The Bible records in, the, in uh, Isaiah 53, we turned everyone to his own way. We're like sheep that have gone astray. And basically what happens is when we turn to our own way, we decide we're going to do things our own path. We're going to follow our own direction. God just says, okay, you want to run astray? You want to go and do things your own way? That's fine. Have it your own way. And then we say, God, why are you angry against our prayer? And God's only response must be because that's what you asked for. You turned away, I've turned away. It's easy. Turn back, I'll turn back. And that's what God promises in the book of James. Draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. How long until we're restored? How long until we're heard of God and our prayers begin to be answered in the affirmative, the yes, absolutely? Well, how long until you repent? That's the real question. How long until you turn to Him? Then you'll be restored. Then you'll be heard. And this is what the psalmist is getting at. He's decided, give ear, O oh God, hear me. Turn us, shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Verse 7 Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Here in Psalm 80, we see a, a turn to God in repentance, not just for the psalmist, but for the whole nation. He's having them even sing these psalms as a collective. And these words apply to us today just as much as they did to the people of Israel then. Cause thy face to shine. Of God's countenance, look with me in Psalm chapter 44. Cause thy face to shine, O God. Psalm chapter 44. God's countenance, His shining face, shows His favor and provision for us. Psalm 44 and verse 1, We have heard with our ears. O God, our fathers have told us what work Thou didst in their days. In the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance. Because thou hast a favor unto them. God's wonderful countenance that turns to us when we turn to Him causes that we're provided for things that we can't get ourselves. Possessing nations, overcoming sins. These nations, the Bible records, were greater and mightier than the people of Israel in every way. And yet God removed them so that He could plant His own people. Now that's favor and that's provision. That's God specifically looking out on His people and saying, Watch what I will do. Turn to me. Look unto me, all ye nations. Look unto me, my people. His countenance also lightens our path. Go to Psalm chapter 89. Psalm chapter 89. 
In the day and time that we live in, as dark as it is and as confusing as it can be, if you turn to the media, every day it's different. Are we going to live or are we going to die? Are we going to make it to 2021 or are we going to fall away before that? Is the market going to crash or is it going to pull through? It's dark, it's confusing, and yet God always lightens our path as believers. Psalm 89, look at verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. His lightning to our path isn't just to reveal the What's in darkness, you know, if you're walking down a dark path in the woods, you need a light to show you what's in front of you so you don't trip and fall and get hurt. But it's not only just for that to lead us, it's there to strengthen us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And this is what he keeps saying here. You'll be exalted, you'll be blessed if you know the joyful sound of walking with God and in the light of his countenance. Cause thy face to shine upon us that we can have favor and provision in the day and time that we live in. Cause thy face to shine upon us, God, that our path could be lightened so that we could be led in the right path, in the right direction, but also that we can be strengthened through it. Joyful, rejoicing. Can you imagine being happy in 2020? There's a lot of people suffering from depression and sadness. It's clear that they don't have the blessed joy that comes with being in the countenance, the shining face of God Almighty. Just as much as we need favor and provision, turn to Psalm 90, it's just across the page. Just as much as we need a light to our path, which leads and strengthens us in our journey, we also need rebukes. We also need our hearts to be corrected and revealed to us. Look at Psalm chapter 90 and in verse 7. It says, For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. If we're going to go to God and say, Lord, turn us again. Lord, hear us. Bring us back to thee. Cause your face to shine upon us. We have to expect that we are going to be rebuked. We are going to be chastened. And that even our secret sins, the sins that your neighbor can't look upon you and see. The sins that happen behind closed doors, the sins that happen in your own mind and in your own heart, those sins God reveals, and He reveals them to the end that you could go to Him, as the psalmist does and says, Give ear, O God, I have this sin I want to repent of. Turn us, and we turn to Him, and then God shines upon us and saves us. Eternally saves us from our sins that we're committing today, saves us from the trials and struggles that are coming from the outside in, saves us from all challenges that we face. Turn us, God, essentially that we can see what's always been there. It's not like God's shining face disappeared just because we weren't looking at it. It's not like God's provision was gone just because we weren't receiving it. It's not like God wasn't waiting there to rebuke us and chasten us and get us in the right direction just because we were ignoring, perhaps, His gentle leading. It's always been there. We just needed to turn to Him to see it. Back in Psalm chapter 80, verse 7, that chorus says, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Here's a little glimpse at Israel and what happened with them. Verse 8, it says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it, being that vine. Thou preparest room for it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. Look at that provision from God. Plucks up that vine, makes room for it, plants it, get such a deep root as a result of the great provision of God, both in water and in light, that it fills that entire land. Verse 10, it says, The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars, tall and strong. She sent out her bows into the sea and her branches unto the river. Look, Israel was brought out of suffering, brought out of 
slavery, brought out of bondage and was esteemed highly and exalted as a result of God Almighty God showing her favor, showing her the direction that she ought to go by the light of his countenance, rebuking her and leading her gently in the path that she ought to go and correcting her heart. Israel was blessed as a result of their relationship and their seeing God's countenance before them at all times. But the sorry state now reminds me of us in many ways. It says in verse 12, Why hast thou then broken down her hedges? In other words, why hast thou taken down what was protecting them? What had sealed them in and closed them in? And guarded them? The Lord is to be a hedge round about us. Like a natural wall to separate us from our enemies and us from those that would hurt us and us from dangers. The psalmist asks, Why hast thou broken down her hedges? So that all they which pass by the way do pluck her. In other words, everybody that just passes by because the natural protection of God has been removed can just pluck a little here and pluck a little there. And if you've ever had a plant, you know, you're growing a garden and something just walks by and plucks at it every once in a while, it's not very long before that plant starts to get sick. And it's not very long before that plant starts to wither and, and, and fade away and then eventually it dies. Only one little rabbit going by your plant and picking off a few branches here and there can do much destruction. That's why we like to put a hedge of protection around our garden. And that's why we would hope that God would put a hedge of protection around us. But here the psalmist knows and it's clear and he asks God the question, Why hast thou broken down her hedges so that all which pass by do pluck her? It says in verse 13, The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beasts of the field doth devour of it. We can go, if you would, to Psalm chapter, no, Isaiah 59. Keep your finger there in Psalm 80, of course. Isaiah 59. We can take example about what we hear here. Isaiah 59, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Look, it's not God's doing, essentially. It's, it's not that God is somehow tied up, or he can't hear, or he's not mighty to save anymore. So the question when it was asked, well, why hast thou broken down the hedges? Why is your mighty hand seems shortened. Why is your ear heavy that you're not hearing us, God? Verse 2 gives the answer. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath uttered perversions. Now here this is all talking about you talking about us personally here in Isaiah he says look God's hand's not shortened it's not like God couldn't step in and set this right it's not like God is lacking anything it's not like God is not able but look what you have done your iniquities your sins your hands defiled your fingers full of iniquity your lips have spoken lies your tongue is uttering perverseness and as a result of our actions if you could, you would read over the next four verses and you'll find what they are doing. Look, is it, it's as a result of God's people that the nation goes to hell. It's as a result of God's people that the nation comes into condemnation and will not live righteously and will not follow after what is right and appropriate and, and suitable and good in the eyes of God. And this is what Isaiah begins. He's like, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's you. That's why they trust vanity. That's why they speak lies. That's why they conceive mischief. In verse 5, that's why they hatch cockatrices' net eggs and weave the spider's web. That's why they, verse 6, cover themselves with their works, and their works are the works of iniquity. That's why they act the way they do. Verse 8 says, the way of peace 
They know not, and there is no judgment in their doings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. And Christ is the Prince of Peace. But it began with you, Christian. His hand is not shortened. They're the way they are because of your sins. In verse 9, it continues, says, Therefore is judgment far from us. Therefore doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. And that's a problem when we know our sins, but we won't do what the psalmist first brings to God's mind in that chorus. Turn us again, O God. Turn us again. When we do it simple, it's easy. We turn again. God turns us by drawing us into His own self, by drawing us after righteousness through the preaching of the Word, through the reading of the Word, through the, the psalms and songs that we hear, through the conviction of our own spirit and our conscience working towards doing right. God continually does these things. And when we know where we're wrong and refuse to turn unto Him, this is why we struggle together with the world. Look, God provided in Egypt a Goshen, didn't he? Egypt, the world, was full of all of its wickedness, and Israel had a Goshen. Israel had plagues fall upon it, destruction and misery and the loss of even the firstborn eventually. There was a Goshen that was protected from all of these things. But yet here we are, and we struggle together with the world around us in Canada. There is no us versus them in this. And so, as a result, what we need is God's return. We need righteous judgment in our land. And how do we get it? We go to God and we ask for it. You can go back to Psalm chapter 80. Psalm chapter 80. If God's people would seek Him. What does it say in Second Chronicles? Pray, humble themselves, seek His face. It starts with us. It's where judgment begins at the house of God. If God wouldn't turn around our whole nation as a result of us living righteously, He certainly would provide for us a Goshen, and He certainly would judge them as harshly as He did, as he did Egypt. And that's, that's the, the least of what we could expect. The best thing, obviously, would be that God's people get right, turn unto Him, He turns to us, saves us, and as a result of that great revival, begins to clean up the nation of Canada. That would be the best thing that could possibly happen. Would that We would just see widespread revival and return to Christ. But the worst thing that could happen would be also awesome for us, that He would just put that hedge of protection around His people and judge them according to their deeds. We need God's return. And so while we think at Christmas time about Christ coming in the manger, we ought to, now from where we stand, think about Christ come in the clouds. We need that. We need Him to be active and present and desired by God's people, especially in this land. Psalm chapter 80 and verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this this vine. As he did aforetime in Bethlehem's manger, God Almighty, please do now again. Only this time as our conquering Savior. Visit this vine. Visit us. Visit spiritual Israel again. But not, not only us, not only this vine that God referred to as being plucked out of Egypt, chosen for himself for a specific and peculiar task. Not only come to this vine, come to us, but look at verse 15. And in the vineyard, which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou made it strong for thyself. Don't only come, God, to us, Israel, to the vine, but also come to the vineyard, those that are around us, those in whose land we dwell, those where we have been planted in order to flourish. Currently, our state spiritually in Canada 
is one of waste. We're being devoured, the Bible records, by the boar and by the wild beast. At Christ's return, what are we going to see? Verse 16, it is burnt with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. We're looking forward to that second coming of Christ. And you can keep your finger there in Psalm chapter 80. I just want to go quickly to Matthew and what we looked at last week. Matthew chapter 13. So we are seeing, first of all, God's people plucked up, planted, given a place, and yet God drops the hedge of protection. Why? Well, I believe that's a result of them turning away from him. Because he says, turn us again, O God, turn us again and cause thy face to shine. Shine upon us when we turn unto thee. But as a result of their sins and their iniquities and their not following after God wholly with their own heart, the hedge is down, the boar destroys them, the wild beast devours them. And yet the psalmist cries, return, God, return. Come down, look down from heaven, behold and visit this vine. And I believe this is... Very similar to what's being described in Matthew chapter 13. Look with me in verse 38. Remember the psalmist said, Come to this vine and come to this vineyard. Matthew 13 verse 38 says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear. Let him hear. He talks about how both will grow up together in the time of the end. Both the tares and both the wheat. Often indistinguishable one from another until the very end. You know what we're going to see in the day and time that we live in? Closer and closer to the time of Christ's return. Persecution will begin to ramp up against the children of light. You'll see very clearly who are the tares and who are the wheat. It'll become more and more apparent as the persecution and the enmity between them increases and increases and increases. And God will judge. God will set the one to fire and the other shall shine forth in the kingdom of their father. Back in Psalm chapter 80, I believe the same thing's taking place. We have both groups together. God's people cry out, Return, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven, behold, and visit this vine. Visit your people. This same vine of Israel that you plucked up out of the world so many years ago. Visit us again. And visit, verse 15, the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou mayest made it strong for thyself. The nations around us ought to be strong to the glory of God, and yet they've turned away. And so, verse 16, it is burnt with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. And that's exactly what's going to happen when Christ returns. The burning fire, the flame, the destruction will be as a result of God, Almighty God, looking at them with his countenance. With what? Rebuke. They will have no covering. For their shame. Verse 17 says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom thou made it strong for thyself. God, of course, here will be talking about Jesus Christ. By extension, though, those that are in Christ, his hand will be mighty upon us, the man of his right hand, those whom are girded by the right hand of God. Those that are made strong by the light of his countenance will be carried through this time and lifted up and preserved. And I believe all this is so that God could show himself as that shepherd, show himself as that Lord of hosts, the leader of the mighty army of his own people. Verse 18, So will not we go back from thee. Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. 
See, in Christ's first coming, there was many people that rejected him. Despised and rejected a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. They took him in his frailty and put him upon a cross. But he did that to the end that he could save all that call upon him. His second coming will be a little bit different. His second coming is going to be in power and in might and in burning with fire and in destruction. And this is the coming that we look forward to. It's wonderful to think about what Christ did when he came in Bethlehem's major, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and walked that walk in his first coming in order that he would die the death that we deserve, pay the penalty for all sins, rise again triumphant. It's even more wonderful for us now to not just reflect, but to think on what's next. And what's next is Christ returning in glory. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven, behold, and visit this wine. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou hast made strong. So will we not go back from thee. Quicken us and we will call upon thy name. And ultimately, as many have drawn back after his first coming, as many have turned and forsaken him, and, and generations have gone by, and, and some lived righteously and sought after God, but some despised him and utterly rejected him entirely. His final coming, we will not go back from him. We'll be quickened, alive, alive forevermore, even as Christ is. That's what I look forward to. But for us now and where we're standing, it begins, as the chorus says, Turn us again, verse 19, Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. We need to turn again unto God, especially in these last days, and not just as a last resort. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Get close to him. Turn to him, and behold his face, that it would shine upon you. And we shall be saved. Whatever you're going through, deliverance is waiting. It's as simple as turning to God. Whatever you're struggling with, suffering through, confused about, scared, worried, whatever it is, turn us again, O oh God. Turn to him. He'll cause his face to shine on us. And we shall be saved. Christ in the last days is looking for a remnant. Let's be a part of that. Let's be a part of that group. <clears throat> what did he provide? Right? His face gives you favor and provision. Who doesn't need that in these last days? Looking upon his face leads you and strengthens you. Puts a smile on that face when everyone else is so sad and lonely and depressed and mourning and weeping. Also, it rebukes and reveals our heart. In other words, God will show us where we're actually hindering our own walk. That's what we need. We need God to show us our sins, not just so he can browbeat us and show us how wrong we are and beat us down. No, he reveals stuff to us so that we can accept and acknowledge that we have sinned. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's only a good thing. And in the end, all of these things that God is going to do upon this earth, including burning it with fire, cutting down what men have put up, is good in the end. Because it will cause us to turn to Him. And I pray, God, that many more would turn to Him and say, God, give ear. Hear me when I cry, when I call upon Thy name. Don't get down. Don't get discouraged. Even as Christ came in Bethlehem's manger, He's coming again. This is the Christmas that we all can look forward to. Jesus is coming again. <laughs> That's good news for all of us. Amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this glimpse into the Psalms. And I know it applies directly to a context and a people that are far, far away and, and, and in the past. But you wrote all these things for our admonition and for our learning upon whom the ends of the world have come. Looking forward, Christ, to your return. Not as much as I should be. I ought to have a smile on my face more. I ought to be encouraged and strengthened in my walk. I ought to, I ought to turn quicker to you. But I've been in the world and of the world, and, and I want to have a Goshen. Begin to separate us, Lord, first in our own thoughts and, and minds, 
then in our works and our actions, and then begin to work mightily in this people that is gathered here to the end that you would be glorified. Turn us again, Lord. Cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved from whatever we are struggling with and whatever we are facing. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.